So welcome, I'm Karen Nelson, the co-director of the Center for Literary and Comparative Studies in the Department of English at the University of Maryland. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us um, today as we celebrate Stephen Roycewicz's recent publication, Thornton Wilder, Classical Reception and American Literature from Rutledge. I'll briefly introduce our speakers today and then turn the conversation over to them. Um, I'll note that we're recording this session and that we've turned on the captioning. So if you need captioning, it will be imperfect, um, but it's better than nothing. And so that's available along the bottom of your screen. Um, so after a college degree in biology, sorry, people are still coming in, which is wonderful. Um, a college the STEM students. Yeah, after a college degree in biology, Dr. Roycewicz earned an MD from Georgetown in 1969, followed by a psychiatry residence also at Georgetown. He broadened his lifelong interests in language and literature with an MA degree in classics, Latin and Greek 2012 UMD, and after retirement from psychiatry with a PhD in comparative literature in, in 2017, also from the University of Maryland. He credits his 40 years of the, of the practice of psychiatry with his efforts to pay full attention to nuance, allusions, and patterns in narrative. Dr. Roycewicz will open our session with a five minute introduction to the project. I'll put the link to the publisher's website in the chat for the volume, and there is a 20% discount code that's available, but I'll do that after I stop talking yeah. because I have trouble doing two things at one time. Um, so that will come in a couple of minutes. Joining the conversation today is Judith P. Hallett, Professor of Classics and Distinguished Scholar Teacher Emerita at UMCP. Professor Hallett co-directed Roycewicz's 2017 thesis with Jane Donoworth, who's a professor of English and Distinguished Scholar Teacher Emerita, also at UMCP. Hallett is the author of Fathers and Daughters in Roman Society, Women and the Elite Family, and the editor of and contributor to numerous essay collections. Her awards and honors are too extensive to list, but you can check out her um, classics website and it details all of these things. Pro professor Hallett will have several discussion questions about the classics and Wilder. Our third um, contributor for the formal part of the program is Lincoln Conkel, who is a professor at the College of New, New Jersey, where he teaches courses in dramatic literature. He's also the board member of the Thornton Wilder Society, as well as co-founder, um, sorry, I'm admitting people as I do this, and board <laughs> member of the um, Thornton Wilder Society, as well as co-founder and board member of the Edward Albee Society. He is the author of Thornton Wilder and the Puritan Narrative Tradition, among the essay collections to which he has edited and contributed, he is co-editor with our own Jackson Breyer of Thornton Wilder, New Perspectives. He is also co-editor of the Thornton Wilder Journal, published by Penn State University Press. His wow. questions for Roycewicz will concern Wilder and American literature. And now I'll turn the session over to our speakers. Welcome to all. Uh, thank you, Karen. I just wanna give a little introduction of how I became involved and fascinated with the study of Wilder. The story goes back almost exactly 12 years when I enrolled in an advanced undergraduate Latin class on the poets Catullus and Horace that was given by Judith Hallett. Now, in her graciousness, she accepted me as a student, although it had been about 50 years since I had a Latin class that was in high school. But as part of this class, in reading the poems of Catullus, we read a lot of literature, and Wilder's The Ides of March was prominent in that. Wilder has Catullus as one of the main characters. He treats him very differently than the historical Catullus, and he translates some of Catullus's poetry. And I was amazed when I looked at some of it, and it looked like he was Wilder was translating it into a very difficult Latin meter, but in English. During this time, and this was 12 years ago, this was March 2010, yeah. um, the Center for Comparative and Literary mm -hmm. Studies, together with the Thornton Wilder Society, the Classical Association of Atlantic States, and others, sponsored a conference called Wait Till I'm Dead. And the important part about this conference is that it was took place in Maryland. It gathered together many Wilder scholars. I was able to meet such prominent people as Wilder's literary executor, Tappan Wilder, and enjoyed speaking to him there, uh, prominent historians of ancient times, etc. The name and part of, of the theme 
goes what Wilder wrote to some people who wanted to write critical essays on him. Now, the basic emphasis of this conference was on Wilder's novels, not on his plays, which are most well known, but all his novels. Um, and here's some things Wilder had said that I learned there or shortly thereafter about critics who would want to write about him. He wrote one letter to Richard Goldstone, who was uh, writing a sort of a biographical sketch of him. And he said, of course, my work is foreign to you. You can't see or feel the play of irony. Go pick on Dreiser or Faulkner. Leave me alone. Write about Arthur Miller. A few years later, he wrote to a professor here in Maryland who wanted to do a thesis or writing about it. And he said, it must be damned hard to find a thesis subject about me because I change all the time. I change my religion every 10 years. Give it up or wait till I'm dead. Work on another writer. So this is a nice challenge to face when you're thinking about writing about Wilder. He had uh, some fine comments about people who tried uh, to criticize him. On the other hand, he had also written in an essay on James Joyce, the history of a writer is his search for his own subject, his myth theme hidden from him, but prepared for him in every hour of his life. In a letter to his nephew, Tappan Wilder, he, he also said, the theme of a work should express some inner latent question in yourself. It is best when this is so deeply present that no one else would recognize it. And one last comment about themes in Wilder. This dates to his college days in Oberlin before he transferred to Yale University. And as a 19 year old student, uh, he wrote in a journal. Since I've been keeping this journal, I have seen the incidents of a day's life in a new light. One aspect of this consideration of events is the surprising discovery that life is a matter of strands and threads. In the rondo of life, there are more recurrent themes than there appear at first hearing. So we have a distinguished writer loaded with prizes who says, don't write about me, pick on Arthur Miller. And you have someone who says, hey, there's themes, but they're kind of hidden. You know, we'll, um, we'll play hide and seek. Um, we will see in the discussion if we've found some of the themes that are meaningful for our understanding of this great writer. I have prepared a handout that I'll, I'll ask Karen to post that um, lists Wilder's chronology, the plays and novels he's written, his education in classics, and some uh, particular themes uh, that should be in, in, in the chat. And I'm going to pass the baton on now to Judith Hallett, who introduced me to Wilder and uh, supported and helped me in enormous ways in the writing of this book. Judy? I, let me begin by thanking Karen and the Center for um, helping to foster and birth Wilder studies at Maryland for over a decade. So let me now move to my questions for Steve. Um, and the big overarching question is, how does your book produce new knowledge and contribute new insights on Wilder, especially but not only in connection with his relationship to classical Greek and Roman literature and the ancient Greek and Roman past? And I'd like to begin with a very specific question about what new light has he been able to shed on Wilder especially but not only as a student of the classics, by his archival research, which is an important new research development in his monograph. So take it away, Steve, about archival. Well, you, you know, this book would have been impossible without archival research yeah. and numerous archives. Uh, the big one is Beinecke Library in Yale, which has Oh, thousands of folders on, on Wilder. It, it's impossible to read everything. It is a lifetime. They saved everything, almost, almost every letter. It includes his journals. It includes the manuscripts where you can see Wilder at work, crossing things out, putting things in, drawing arrows. 
And it includes not only Wilder's works, but works of his family and works of his attorney. I was very privileged when the attorney's files went to Beinecke, they were not yet cataloged or entered, but they were kind enough to let me see the files I was interested in, as long as I could give a year, label it from one year. In addition to Beinecke Library, uh, we examined, Judy and I, the papers of the American Academy at Rome. Walter was a student there, um, 1920, 1921. And the files show what the Academy was like at that time. It showed several things in conjunction with Wilder's own letters. Um, the impact of a friend he met there, Laro de Bosis, which I think led to Wilder's more extensive engagement with Greek literature. Part, two particular professors, uh, the file showed the classes or lectures they gave at that time. One was Professor McGuffin, who led archaeological digs. And Wilder says, nothing's ever the same once you've excavated an Etruscan city beneath the streets and seen this and that. But McGuffin gave a lecture at that time on the influence of women in classical antiquity. And I think this was very important for Wilder in the way he wrote about classical antiquity and the importance of women in his life. The other professor was McDaniel, Walton Brooks McDaniel, who gave lectures according to the Academy documents on the private life of Romans and the survival themes from that in modern Italy and its relationship uh, to Greek culture and on Latin literature contained concerned with early Christianity. All these archival stuff enrich our study of Wilder. I only wish I was able to spend more time at the, yeah. at the uh, Meineke Library. Unfortunately, the pandemic came and things were closed for a year and a half or more. But I, I think the archival research may have been a little more fuller than on the standpoint of the classics and Wilders and previous investigators. Yes, it certainly was. And um, one of the points you've made leads me to my next question, because if we look at the lives of the life of Lauro de Bosis, who had a very strong, formidable mother and an older female lover, uh, the actress Ruth, uh, Ruth Draper. And if we look at the life of Ralph Van Diemen McGoffin, whose aunt was the famous uh, Roman archaeologist Esther Van Diemen, um, there, uh, the, the men that he forged close bonds with at this point were men who showed an incredible interest in and deference to women in a time when that wasn't particularly uh, popular. So what I'd like to now ask is, um, about two major foci of your studies. The first is on wise female figures, advisors, and counselors, but also the intertextual focus of your work, which is extremely important. Uh, and how did these two foci forge previously undetected links between the wilder writings that are set in classical antiquity, because quite a few of them are not only the Eyes of March, but the Woman of, Woman of Andros, um, but also uh, those that are set in different times. Um, so I'd like to hear how you put all this together. Wilder, Beginning with female sages, yeah. <laughs> Wilder first went to a play when his mother brought him as a young boy to a Shakespearean play. His mother, translated Italian and French poetry, emphasized his literary leanings, emphasized cultural attainments, had to meet various people when this was possible. And so I, th I think his mother, whom he called one of Shakespeare's girls, which is a nice little compliment, uh, was an very influential part on, on his entire life and his writing. Walter's use of woman dates, uh, uh, goes back all the way to Sappho when he, um, Sappho, about 600 or so BCE, uh, wrote in uh, Iolic uh, Greek, it wrote various poems, but she's especially known for those in the 
sapphic meter, a very uh, complex meter. Um, Wilder makes reference to Sappho in the Ides of March, where uh, Clodia, one of the main female characters, refers to Sappho in literature. Wilder, as his college graduation, wrote the class poem, just like Emily uh, Webb does. But he wrote it in Latin, which was common at Yale at that time. And it was in the incredible sapphic meter, which is not easy to write. Um, yeah. Wilder also was influenced by historical characters or purely fictional characters that occur in the, in the classics. The Platonic Dialogues has two famous women, Diotima and Aspasia. Uh, Diotima teaches Socrates about love and Aspasia is described by Socrates as writing speeches for famous Athenians like Pericles and teaching literature in speeches so that we get characters like Chrysis and the woman of Andros who sort of teaches literature to people. And we get other characters um, like the Madame de Sévigné figure in the Marquesa de Montemayor in the Bridge of San Luis Rey who takes a whole uh, tradition of female literature and, and makes it live for the, for the current day. There are, maybe a little later, we'll talk about other figures of the female sage that relate back in one way. Chrysis and the Woman of Andros relates back to Greek comedy and, and, and to these other figures. But I would, I would also include the, Wilder's two most famous women, Dolly Levi in The Matchmaker, often better known as Hello Dolly, and Emily Webb in Our Town as contributing to this classic tradition of strong teachers and purveyors of wisdom by females. Yeah, and what's interesting, of course, is if you look over the whole uh, range of his work, um, they're from, they're of all ages, these women, and of all um, social classes. Uh, I'm a very young. In yeah. one of his maybe less known novels, uh, uh, Heaven's My Destination, yeah. the, uh, the sister of, of the wife of George Brush say some fine uh, words to him about uh, no one can live up to the rules all the time. This is just a brief, brief thing, but I think she fits into that category of the female sage. Yeah, you know, I want to say two things about Emily Webb because, of course, she's studying Cicero <laughs> in, in our town. And then you have a wonderful quote in your book likening Emily to Aspasia in Plato's Menexenus and uh, like Chrysus in The Woman of Andros, and that she's sort of a political inspiration in certain ways. And this is important. Yes. Because in our town, her own dad, this is of course set before 1920, uh, talks about how everybody participates in town governance. The men by direct voting and the women by indirect voting, AKA, you know, having influence over the votes of the men. So I always, that was a very Athenian situation. So I, I'm now going to move to another uh, very sensitive question, but one that I think deserves a lot of attention and which you've given a good deal of attention, namely how the belated recognition of Wilder's homoerotic sensibilities, which may or may not have been physically realized, affects our reading of his work and in particular, The Ides of March. Um, Wilder was very reticent in speaking about his sexuality. I, I went through his journal articles, and not a journal in the sense of a private diary. There are more journal in the sense of uh, intellectual development. He very rarely speaks about, uh, about uh, sexuality. And when he does, he often says, well, Goethe was this ladies' man did this and that, but the important part was he sublimated it. And he also writes about... Um, in his preparing for his lectures at Harvard, he writes about Walt Whitman and he says, well, the important point here is to sublimate it into art. 
So there's not much directly on Wilder's own experience. A couple thoughts I'll bring to mind the next to the Ides of March. At one point, there were three women who were romantically um, pursuing Wilder. One was a woman a little older than him who was married. Another was a woman the same age. Another was a younger college student. To one of these women, he wrote that he was still suffering from the experience of loving someone with all the exaggeration one can imagine. But I was not only loved, not loved, I was laughed at. Now, he doesn't say who this object was or when this occurred. Uh, it might have been in college, might have occurred in Rome, but that was there. The Ides of March have depict an extremely close relationship with Julius Caesar and the Roman poet Catullus. Uh, a few critics have seen this as hinting at a homosexual theme. The best description of this is not available in English, is by Thierry Giboff, uh, Thornton Wilder, L'homme qui a aboli le temps, which means uh, Thornton Wilder, the man who abolished time. That's actually a quote from Malcolm Cowley, but he said that the Ides of March suggest what he calls an amitié amoureuse, a, a loving friendship between Catullus and Caesar, and that he puts, a while to put value on this loving friendship, and he creates a space in which uh, homosexuality is validated. The other person sometimes mentioned as a, um, a, a homosexual, fictional character is Simon Stimson in Our Town as a closeted homosexual. I think Dr. Gibbs says some people ain't made for small time, small town life. Um, these are some theories that are written about. What's interesting, Wilder quotes a lot of Catullus's poetry. He quotes some of the love poetry, but he does not directly quote any explicit poems or the poems that deal with homosexual relations with the boys. Catullus wrote poems about Juventus. However, he alludes to one such poem. In one of the characters, Cornelius Nepos describes Catullus as uh, very licentious in conversation, but austere in his life. That's a direct allusion to, Cat to Catullus 16, which is a, a sexually explicit diatribe that says, well, a poet can be chased, although what he writes about is licentious. So I think Wilder was aware of this in Catullus and others, but he was a deeply private man and he didn't um, explicitly focus on this. In his comments on Walt Whitman's um, homosexuality, uh, he says this, and this may be something we should keep in mind. This is only a first skirmish with a sharply complicated subject. Interesting. So last but not least, Steve, um, for the classicists among us, why should Wilder be taught in classical reception and Latin classes? What do you see the value of bringing Wilder in to the study of classics and its reception? You know, Wilder, in my opinion, saw himself as a poetic doctor, so a learned playwright, a learned writer who utilized Greek and Latin classics, but never simply. It was intricate, often indirect. He often integrated with themes from biblical sources, medieval literature, uh, early modern and modern works. Um, but he what he's doing is, is probably the highest point of intertextuality, which is, it's called various names by different critics, but it's when one work communicates with another work and maybe Thanks. rewrites it. Um, exactly. Couple examples, the big one, I, I two big ones, Virgil um, and Terence. Wilder writes in his Woman of Andros that it's based uh, partly on the play by Terence, The Woman of Andros, which itself was based on these Greek plays, etc. cetera. Um, what's interesting here is that how Wilder combines and changes. And The Woman of Andros in Terence's play 
which is about uh, 190, 200 BCE, more or less, was a comedy. Wilder wrote a tragedy about it. Took place in Athens. Wilder's novel takes place in an island in the Mediterranean, Brynos. Took place in classical times in Athens and Wilder doesn't specify the time, but later on he says around oh, 200 to 100 BCE. But the big change, something that's not directly there, but could be, could be seen, could be interpreted, is that Chrysus, the woman of Andros, is now a sage. She's a teacher. She's erudite. She teaches Greek literature to these men. This was not directly in the play by Terence, but it's Wilder's response to Terence, which opens up a different way of looking at it. Diatima Asclesia could, could all, were also believed to be courtesans in some way. The hint was there if you combine these classical sources that Wilder did. The, the other main source, I think, and, and um, if people are interested, I could uh, have a uh, little chart put up about it, is Dolly Levi. Yeah. Dolly Levi is a parasitus, a uh, maneuverer, a someone who tries to get a free meal, a free loader. It, quite common in Greek new, um, new comedy and in Roman comedy around the year 200, but he changes it by emphasizing those things that are a little there in some place, but not marked in most, which Dolly then brings everybody to life. So if a classicist is teaching the plays of Terence or Plautus, where I think Cleostrata is another woman who rules the roost, who, who is the poeta, I think it's called, I would I combine this with Wilder. And I would combine Dolly Levi with any play that deals with the parasitis. Well, of course, all our parasitoi or parasiti um, in new comedy are men. That's another thing that's so that's interesting. That's right. Well, I'll just is the, who made this a female. Is, 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 it's is, a very interesting um, comparison of all the characters in um, Roman comedy with uh, the characters in The Matchmakers. One, one of the first articles, actually, you gave me a, a photocopy of that article that occurred in the, uh, the Classical Journal of New England. Exactly. So thanks so much, Steve. I just wanted to add one point in your book that I think bears emphasis, which is that his so-called modernism his time sequences, to get back to that French title, that are complex, synchronous, overlapping, and, and revisited more than chronological, very important point you make. Um, this um, technique of narrative is anticipated um, by certain classical authors, among them Virgil, uh, in the Eclogues and in the Aeneid, and for my tastes, um, Ovid. Um, in his elegy that eul eul eulogizes um, his fellow poet Tobolus. This is Amores 3 9. Yeah. And this is a scenario that transcends time and place with you know, all kinds of living and fictional and uh, different characters meeting and you know, communicating. Um, and it creates a dramatic scenario. This is what's so interesting that um, the elegy often has this dramatic component. But not only are people you know, reuniting in the lower world, which is where a lot of these you know, interesting narrative um, happenings occur, but they're doing it in the process of mourning, of celebrating and, and um, lamenting a lost lives. So anyhow, I just want to thank I, you for all you've done to open so many eyes and doors. <laughs> my conclusion is that Wilder's modernism and his time sequence is actually a fulfillment of the classical yes, tradition. Yes, Characters yes. that address the stage are common, for instance, at exactly. the conclusion of comedies by Plautus. Wilder kept that, but he changed it. They addressed the stage during tragedies as well. Yeah. Exactly. 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to pass this now to, to Lincoln Conkle. I think Lincoln wrote the first sustained historical critical work of Wilder that I ever read, and I still rely on it all the time. Oh, well, thank you for, for saying that, Steve. And, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for zooming in uh, for the celebration of this uh, brand new uh, study of, of Wilder's uh, works, his plays, and his novels, and so forth. And I want to congratulate Steve on the, on the publication uh, of this work. It's, it truly is, uh, truly is brilliant. Um, so uh, I'm supposed to speak in relation to American literature and, uh, and get Steve to respond to that. Um, and so what, what I just put in the chat is a um, um, uh, link to the Thornton Wilder Society's website and its page that lists all of Wilder's works, his plays and his novels and, uh, and collections of one act plays. And so you might use this as, uh, as a reference um, uh, with regard to this question I'm ultimately gonna uh, pose to, uh, to Steve. So on this idea of Wilder and classical American literature, uh, what, what really comes to my mind in, in thinking about his in, entire career as a, a playwright and a novelist, um, and most people are not as familiar with his novels, is how he alternated between uh, writing works that were either set in classical times or, um, um, you know, have classical, you know, uh, very explicit classical themes or, and, and so forth. And then uh, other works that are set in America with American characters and in either, in either contemporary American times or America within the last you know, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, something like that. So if you look at his career overall, you, you can see him alternating between classical and American works. So, um, and, they, and they kind of come in clusters. So in the 1920s, he writes his very first novel, The Cabala, which um, Steve writes uh, about extensively and it's his use of Virgil in that and other classical elements. Uh, the characters turn out to be modern uh, incarnations of the gods of antiquity. Uh, his third novel is The Women of Andros and, and uh, that's set in ancient Greece. Uh, there's at least a couple of his three minute plays and The Angel at Troubled Waters and uh, The Waters and other plays that are classically based. Uh, so he's got this, you know, this first period in the 1920s where he comes on the scene as novelist and he, and he has you know, two novels that are very classically influenced. And then in 1931, uh, with The Long Christmas Dinner and other plays in one act, he switches to American subjects, to American characters and settings. And, and, um, and then in the novel in, in 1935, Heavens by Destination is taking place you know, in, in the mid thirties, you know, during the depression and so forth. Um, with a very American character. And, and, um, and then of course he goes into Our Town, The Merchant of Yonkers, which would later be retitled The Matchmaker, The Skin of Our Teeth, and then the screenplay for Alfred Hitch Hitchcock's film, Shadow of a Doubt. So he has a 10 year period there of, of really you know, American works, all of them which have classical influences, which is one of the, the most you know, fascinating things about Steve's book is, is how he brings out those classical influences and in all those American works. And then after World War II, Wilder, you know, publishes a, a novel, The Ides of March, obviously a classical, and in his last full-length play in the, the 1950s is The Alcestia, taking place in ancient Greece, and then in the 60s, he publishes his last two novels, The Eighth Day and Theophilus North, both which are set in America. So it's really interesting that this writer who has such a you know, strong classical education and so forth, and, he, and that shows up in his works early on, but then he switches over to American focused works. Then he goes back to classical for a while. Then he comes back to American. So Steve, I'm, I wonder in, in the light of your study, you know, what is the relationship between these classical work periods uh, or groupings of his works, plays and novels and the American 
you know, uh, uh, works and no uh, novels and plays? And what's the what's the relationship between them, or or why does he switch back and forth? Uh, what what do you have to say about that? Uh, that which is a pretty unique, uh, you know, uh, aspect of Wilder's career. Um, this um, creative tension between classical times or classical themes and settings and American themes, I think, goes all the way back to elementary school. He wrote a, a wonderful essay, I guess, as a school assignment. And when in sixth grade, and it was on Roman history and Roman gods. And he talks about the Roman gods, the, this and that, like especially mentions um, Mercury, for instance, and Apollo. And he talks about Julius Caesar, but he also mentions um, ways in which they're modern. Mercury, the god of messengers. That means he's a god of messenger boys. And you get a little hint of that, I think, in uh, the first act of The Skin of Our Teeth. And he mentions the letter writing by Julius Caesar, how Apollo had um, influenced him to, to write six or eight letters at a time, the dictating actually, uh, but composing them. And this survival of the gods began in sixth grade and went out, went through the Kabbalah and then comes up in the very American theme in the eighth day when many of the characters are associated with female goddesses, especially Athena. Wilder gave various talks around the country, often in conjunction with a, um, a British um, novelist, uh, Hugh Walpole. And in them, he talked about his wish to merge to marry the American spirit with the classical theme. And I think that's what he's done. But there are some times in which it's absolutely an American setting, but it's also a more broad universal American setting. Um, let's take the Bridge of San Luis Rey, which seems to be American, uh, South American. Um, it's partly based on a short story uh, by uh, Prosper Merime. Um, but the Marquesa de Montemayor, who's very much involved with uh, writing letters, it seemed to be a Gertrude, uh, a um, Madame de Sevigny uh, thing. She writes letters to her daughter, trying to influence her emotionally, etc. She is called Hecuba at one point, that there's some. Mm classical theme there, the, the uh, Queen of Troy who had to go through all these sorrows. The Heaven's My Destination seems to have the um, least overt classical themes, purely American. He may have written this as a, um, as a response to a critic, a Marxist critic who said, Wilder didn't know how to write about America. He, he wrote Heaven's My Destination as his, uh, as his next book. But I think there's a few things in them. What fascinates me the most, most is when it's both. Uh, we see this in The Skin of Our Teeth where the Antropus family lives in New Jersey. And Sabina says, this author, you don't know what he's doing. He can't make up his mind whether we're living in New Jersey, or we're living in caves. Uh, so uh, these things are kind of integrated and combined. Um, the Eighth Day and Theophilus North are in American settings primarily, but there's obviously strong classical themes in there. In the Eighth Day, the, the protagonist escapes by boat the way Odysseus did for 10 years. And as I said before, there's all multiple avatars that are identified by one of the characters as avatars of the goddess Athena. And then Theophilus North, although it takes place in Rhode Island, and there seems to be some wish fulfillment, uh, the Wilder character, Theophilus was the name of his brother who uh, 
died uh, or was born stillborn or died a few minutes after birth. The North is an anagram of Thornton. Um, there's classical themes about, even though the main setting is America, it starts off by talking about the nine cities of Newport. You know, there's the city for this, this city, the colonial city, the city that was built over at the current. Wow, th these are all the layers of the cities of Rome and Wilder's experience in archeological digs, which had a profound impact and which shows up in the multiple layers in our town, and, and in other, other places as well. So I think Wilder emphasized one or another, but both were always there. And what Wilder did, as maybe opposed to other writers, is when he treated classical themes, he always Americanized it in some way. Yeah. Yeah, and just to, so to follow up on that, I, if I if I have time, so uh, yeah. when you talk about in the the, the skin of our teeth, um, you know, and, and that's maybe you know the best example of of what you call uh, Wilder's literary echo chamber, and you noted that he didn't suffer from her what Harold Bloom called the anxiety of influence. I loved that. Uh, on on the contrary, he paid tribute to the. Pre you know, his predecessors within his works. I mean, his love of literature that he studied in school or read it on his own is manifested in, in his literature. So I wonder if you can comment on that in the context of modernism and, and especially the American novel. I mean, my, my impression is that his contemporaries in the American novel, they weren't really into that. You know, they were following the make it new kind of motto or, or whatever. And um, so could you comment on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, it, it, perhaps alone of the major novelists of his days, he had more living female characters. He, they're kind of weird in Ernest Hemingway, for instance. Uh, uh, you don't see any uh, female stages. Wilder was more attuned to that. The, in our town, he goes out of his way to make it American. There's a, they're putting things in a, um, a time capsule to be found. He lists all the American details. He lists the various things, the milkman going down the street. In, in the skin of our teeth, just the way the messenger boy presents uh, his message, you know, have discovered, uh, such and such of the alphabet or the multiplication table, he goes through a series of messengers that are all American. He says, uh, smoke puffs, those are the Native American signals, smoke signals. And then there's lanterns, the lanterns of Paul Revere's ride. And then there's telegraph and he quotes, uh, it's actually a quote from the book of numbers, but it, it was what was done for the first telegraph. It was, what hath God wrought? So we, and Sabina becomes the winner of the Atlantic City beauty contest. Well, we usually call the winner of the Atlantic City beauty contest Miss America. Wilder had America in everything that he did. It's if it's not direct, it's it's hidden, even in play in novels that are centered in Rome, like the Kabbalah. The American aspect is important. Virgil gives him the message, go back to your own country, a country that's new, but don't forget your Latin. Um, <laughs> I, Judy had mentioned a little quote about um, Emily Dickinson, and I've, um, I've got it uh, in front of me. I'd just like to read that now. Emily Webb, may not at first glance seem to be related to female figures in classical antiquity. Wilder's letters, however, show Emily conceived in part through the influence of the scene in the Homeric underworld in which Achilles speaks to Odysseus. Achilles is also important in the eighth day when the, the choice of Achilles, I mean, Theophilus North. Emily's brief return from the dead strongly reflects Alcestis in the Alcestiad and Emily's notice of the moon and stars 
echoes the poetry of Sappho as well as that of Emily Dickinson. This is a direct quote. Like Aspasia, a character in Plato's Maxinus, who teaches rhetoric, has made many speeches, and whom Socrates praises for her oratory, Emily has a talent for public speaking. Actually, she says, I want to give speeches all my life. Like Chrysis in Wilder's The Woman of Andros, Emily desires the full right to education and citizenship. Like the spirit of Virgil channeling the ghost of Krausa in the Kabbalah, this is right at the conclusion, Emily communicates from beyond the grave, perhaps named for Emily Dickinson, and I make uh, correspondences in, in the book, the master of illusion and precision, who talked about wonder at the everyday. Emily Webb speaks in a rich and complex intertextuality. I think we'll open this up for audience for the discussion, but whom I'd like to call on first if he's willing uh, to talk is Wilder as a literary executor, Tappan Wilder, if he's available. If not, we'll get back to him later. I'm here. <laughs> oh, good, good. Uh, just one oh, minute. yes, it was a wonderful discussion. Very valuable, very rich. I, uh, 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 and a great uh, tribute to you, Steve, and, for a remarkable book. I, uh, I've just finished finally uh, doing, a, redoing uh, considerably, I must say, because it needed it, the afterword for the Kabbalah and the Woman of Andros volume, which completes the Thornton Wilder Library edition. And in it, uh, under each one, uh, Steve, uh, I've asked Steve, and he came through as usual promptly, unlike uh, the editor of the, of the book, um, a wonderful, a few paragraphs about each book and how to understand their uh, uh, classical roots. And I have put them prominently into the afterword of each of, of these, uh, uh, the, the rich afterword for people to enjoy after they enjoy the book. You know, I and I think the differences between Wilder the similarities and differences between Wilder and his generation and the way he deals with his country and the way he deals with Europe. I think of him as an American internationalist and, and kind of always have. Um, I was thinking the other day, uh, and when F. Scott Fitzgerald read the, the, the Woman of Andros, he called it an abomination. I think that was his term. <laughs> It just didn't fit into one of you. <laughs> he liked Wilder very much. They liked each other. He just, he couldn't get it, you see. But we can see that book today in its richness uh, in an extraordinary, fresh, and, and vital way. And all these books seem, seem vital. And the role of women within them is so terribly important. Uh, it makes them timeless and timely and timeless. As, and your book is a timely book and timeless. And I thank you very much for, for producing it and Judy for seeing, uh, encouraging it and all of you for listening in today. And, uh, you know, don't trust me, I pitch. Uh, I, think it's, uh, uh, I think it's a wonderful piece of work. Thank you for having me aboard. Thank you, Tappy. I, I want to give thanks to a person I see is here who I never met in person. That's David Scourfield, who is joining us from Ireland. Yes. Yes. Hello, Steve. Hello, Tappan. Um, everybody. Um, great talk, Steve. Uh, and I love the questions. Very interested in that connection between um, uh, the American and the classical, which I think does come out wonderfully in the Ides of March, which is the novel I've been writing a chapter about, as you as you know. Yes. Um, it's you very wonderfully on the Ides of March and on Augustus by Williams. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting the two together, and I think they speak to each other quite well. Um, but uh, uh, on that point about the American classical um, uh, interface. I mean, it's fascinating. Um, I mean, for instance, um, mm -hmm. the 
if Vestal Virgin is referred to or described as Madam President of the College with the Vestal Virgins. I mean, Madam President, to my ear, couldn't be more American. Um, I mean, Catullus behaves like a frat boy at, at, at one point. Um, uh, yes. Chief of police. No, it didn't. I mean, but so you, not only is the time frame very muddled, yeah, deliberately muddled, um, but the kind of cultural underlay is very complex too. And I think that's one of the fascinating things about, about that novel. Thank you, David. Um, we're open for other comments or questions. There's a lot of people here. I might not see you raising your hand. If you're unmuted, just speak up. Steve? Yes, this hi, is Ellie. Ellie. <laughs> Ellie, I, I want to thank you for all your help when I've made a comparison between Emily Webb and Emily Dickinson. Yes, you do it so beautifully. And I want to congratulate you on the book. Um, lift my glass to you for the book. Uh, and on the, matter of Emily, <laughs> on the matter of Emily Dickinson, uh, you quoted early on in your talk from a, a journal that Wilder kept, I guess, in college. I couldn't catch it, but it sounded like a celebration of sort of the quotidian that is true of both Dickinson and Wilder, you know, the, the dailiness, the, the, the um, beatitude of the, of the dailiness. And what did you, life is a matter of something and something, but I couldn't hear it. Could you repeat it? Strands and threads is, uh, let me just check. Brand and, th and threads, threads like yes. sewing. Okay. Okay. I'll try to put a, um, a, um, that's a, that's a lovely something on the line. A college on kid line. or whatever he was. It's a lovely observation. Steve, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, I've already spoken once and uh, let me come back and just ask a broad question of, of everybody. How to, how, to what degree do you think in the world of classics and the world of English literature, Thornton Wilder still, uh, uh, what are his prospects for attracting new attention? And uh, you mentioned all those archives, there's a lot of them. Uh, uh, or how does he stand in the pecking order of uh, English and classical literature and those of you trying to get ahead in your fields and get tenure and all the other damn things you have to go through. How does he stand? I, I think he's been uh, unfairly minimized for many decades. Uh, there was a, a German writer who wrote about this. He said the Americans seem to be afraid of cl classics. He, he's the one who called Wilder a poeta doctus, a learned writer. However, I think there's been in the past 10 to 15 years, a resurgence in interest in Wilder with more performances of our town in very um, unique ways. There'll be a, on Broadway, Skin of Our Teeth pretty soon. And the Library of America editions of Wilder's novels, I think, were, are very influential in bringing this out. He's now canonical in one sense. Um, these weren't available 15 years ago. I, I, I think that was a, a great accomplishment, getting the Library of America to publish these things. Modernism has its ups and downs, and sometimes Wilder unfairly is seen as too sentimental. People have never paid attention to Act Three of Our Town, I guess. But Wilder, if there's going to be more interest in intertextuality, I, I think Wilder is a man who has a, a, a strong future. But I think he's still unfairly uh, limited as someone who has. Uh, seems to be just overly sentimental. Now he won three Pulitzer Prizes in two different fields, drama and fiction. He's won all these kinds of awards, but he was maybe too popular and some people resent that. You know, If you're not starving in the garret, you're not a, a, a real writer. Um, I'm hoping that this book unfortunately is, is aimed 
for selling for university libraries more than individual, but I hope a paperback will come out in a few years and it is available in the electronic book. The Wilder Journal, I think, has had wonderful articles about Wilder in literature, in uh, modern literature, and I think that's something else that could be an impetus to do it. Now, I may be um, biased because I, I, I think Wilder is a terrific writer uh, and only he's not even fully explored, but I'm hoping that he comes in, into his own in the 21st century. Steve, and could I... I can I, can I, yes. Yes. Um, hearing Link's questions about the Americanness and the classical of Wilder and hearing you talk about the classical illusions reminds me of two interrelated things. At Wilder's funeral, and Tappy was there so he can remember this, I'm sure, somebody quoted Garson Kanan's famous remark about Wilder when Garson, Garson Kanan, who was a major American playwright and director, and theatrical personality and very good friend of Wilder's, was once asked where he went to college. And he said, I didn't go to college. I went to Thornton Wilder. And uh, I think that speaks to uh, what Steve has been talking about, about the range of Wilder's uh, knowledge and reading and how his work is almost infused with that kind of, I mean, you can't really appreciate Wilder in one sense, unless you read as much as Wilder did, and nobody has, so. Uh, he's in, in French, German, sport. Italian, and Spanish, as well as Latin. Yeah, I mean, he, uh, he was fluent in Italian, German, Spanish. Uh, the other thing that it made me think of, and Wink, and you're very aware of this, is his famous uh, preface to three plays in which he says, and I'm reading it now, every action which has ever taken place has taken place only once at one moment in time and place and has been said and felt many billions of times and never twice the same. And what he's talking about there is the fact that everything, you know, skin of our teeth is the perfect embodiment of that, as you said, because it takes place in New Jersey but it's also very redolent of the Bible and of uh, universal themes. And so every American setting that Wilder uh, sets his work in has ramifications well beyond its particularity because he didn't see anything as being particular. He saw everything as echoing other things. So in a way, those settings are unimportant because they're all universal settings. He, uh, he gets to the universal by focusing on the particular. Exactly. Uh, I'd like to conclude, we're running out of time with just a, a one or two minute quote from the book. And it's on uh, Emily Webb. Reflecting the first person plural of the play, Our Town, when Emily Webb is overcome in her attempt to return to the living, she says, we, we don't have time to look at one another. We is part of Emily's message to the audience. We can confront the mysteries of reality, the joys and sorrows of life, and the significance of death only in this life by observing the beauty of the everyday and the, our interactions with other people with wonder, by taking the time to look at one another, loving each and every particular of our experience. At this moment, at, at Act 3, Emily Webb's wish to make speeches late in since Act 1 is granted. Both Emily Webb and Emily Dickinson wanted to make speeches. Now Emily succeeds. She speaks. She speaks to the audience. She speaks not just to the citizens of Grover's Corners, nor only to the good people of New Hampshire, but to all of us, urging us to notice in a loving manner the common everyday details and to enjoy everyday life fully. This is a moral imperative for Wilder. Virgil had written, Sun lacrime rerit et mentem mortalia tangunt. Here are the tears of the world and human matters touch the heart or haunt the heart. Thornton Wilder, a poeta doctus for modern America, reinterprets Virgil's lacrime rerum 
as tears for the beauty of the world, using the scene depicting wonder of the everyday and the resulting sorrow when individuals recognize this too late. Lacrima rerum are our tears. Well, thank you very much.